Hi everyone. As uh, mentioned, I am Mikkel. I'm the lead creative producer at Space 10. But what the heck is Space 10? Um, it's a research and design lab, and we are on a mission to enable a better everyday life for people and planet. As also mentioned, we are fully and very proudly supported by IKEA, and we work as their global external innovation lab. This is the founder of IKEA. His name was uh, Ingvar Kamrat. And when we started Working with IKEA, getting this opportunity to work with them, we started researching, okay, what are they all about? And we found that they stand on this mission of creating a better everyday life for the many people. So that's, of course, like for us, at least a mission that we could like sign off on, we wanted to be part of, you know. Now that we have this opportunity to work with them uh, and work as their uh, external innovation lab, could we maybe start challenging them a little bit on what that means. Could we look for new opportunities for IKEA beyond home furnishing? Um, so really look at new opportunities that lives up to this mission in new and, and of course uh, still sustainable ways. And I think what is important to, to kind of underline here is that we are external and that's really because it can be very, very difficult to be inside a box and trying to think outside of the box. That's why we were so keen on setting it up as an external lab, because then, you know, we can sit from the outside and then just shout, you know, this is a good idea, this is a good idea, and then hopefully at some point we can actually, you know, meet and then uh, go forward together. And why does it make sense for uh, IKEA, which is one of the world's uh, largest design companies, to set external innovation lab? And it really does because um, the world is changing and it's changing very, very fast. And I think, you know, it's safe to say that the only thing that is constant in the world that we live in today is change. The world has never been, you know, at a state of urgency in the way it is today. We have five macro trends that kind of makes up for all the foundation and inspiration of all the work that we do uh, at Space 10. First one being accelerating urbanization. So we are more and more people uh, moving to the cities. We're living closer and closer together. It is predicted that we will be approximately 10 billion people on this planet by 2050. It's also expected that 70% of those people will live in the cities. We would need to build a city the size, no, twice the size of Berlin from now on and every third month to be able to house all these people in the cities by 2050. So already there, you know, of course, huge challenges. That's just the physical part of things. You know, we also know that loneliness, depression, all these things is a side effect of us living closer and closer together. Political and economic shifts, we really see power shifting from the west to the east. Technological breakthroughs, we see uh, new technologies arising at a pace that we have never, never seen before. Climate and resources, we heard a lot about it already today, but you know, climate change is real, even though there's a lot of people saying that it's not. And then last but not least, demographic shifts. So the world is really getting younger and older at the same time. I recently heard that the biggest diaper company in Japan now sells more diapers to seniors than to babies. I think that's a pretty crazy fact, and I think that few people had a, you know, ability to foresee this 50 years ago, but that is the reality that we live in today. Um, so in a very, very kind of fast-paced world that can seem very, very chaotic, we really see it as our finest task to, to find some pattern in, in patterns in this um, chaos. This is our office uh, in, in Copenhagen, and I really wanted to take the chance to also show you a little bit how that looks, because I don't know if any of you have been there. If not, then this is kind of like a virtual tour of, of the office. It's in the meatpacking district in Copenhagen, so when we took over, it was basically one big freezer. It was like a fish factory before um, that we have now transformed into our little uh, office. This is what you're greeted with when you uh, come into Space 10. This is, was not for us to set up a nice coffee bar for ourselves. This was really to say, okay, now we have the opportunity, now we have the chance. Let's open up and invite the community in. So they can come every single day. We are open for people to come in sit and work, read a book, and it also functions as kind of our extended um, meeting room, if you will, so that we can really have, you know, people, members of the community sit next to us while we have meetings um, um, all along. We have a gallery space where we exhibit our own projects, but also curate projects from um, around that we find uh, inspirational and uh, that we think is uh, really also uh, part of this mission that we are, we are on. Then we have uh, an event space, a stage area, much, uh, much like this, where we host a series of, of different events. And I think, you know, this is really kind of what is in the ethos of Space 10, that we are not a secret lab at all. Um, and we should never strive to be one. So when we had the chance to get this old fish factory and turn it into our office, it was pretty clear from us from the very beginning to also make a community space that was open, that was engaging, to have people come in. We can get just as inspired as people hopefully also can, can sometimes get inspired from, from the things we do. And then together with the community, we can actually progress uh, and, and have a better chance at actually solving some of these uh, issues if we are uh, 
together in it. This is the office. Um, it was just redesigned because when we moved in, we made like one long table, uh, which is super, super nice. But it's also uh, when you're growing, we were seven people when we started and now we are 30 people. So, you know, all of a sudden it's not such a good idea to sit at one long table because, the, you know, the call at the other end of the, the office is also affecting uh, my uh, uh, work routine. This is where we have lunch, so we sit together, the entire team, every day at 12 o'clock around one long table and discuss everything from work to not work. It's also getting a little bit too small now because we're growing and, and, and so on. Um, at the end of this, there is a test kitchen. This was actually a little bit of a, you can say, coincidence because when we took over from the, from the old fish factory, that was just thrown in a corner. We thought, hey, you know, that's such a good idea. Let's just keep it. So we put it up. And that really enabled us to then work with the chef and food designer and have him come in and do a lot of different experiments within food, new uh, sustainable ingredients. And actually the result of everything that he had been doing, as you can see it all the way up in the top, was a cookbook that we released last year, which is called Future Food Today. So really looking at how can we already now make a lot of good decisions, which is more sustainable, but that doesn't have to wait for lab-grown meat or cultured meat to see the light of day. Then we have our basement, what we call the makery. It's a, it's a workshop and we have all the tools you need to prototype, to build our projects, etc. But what we also have is this boy, and it's a CNC machine that has really enabled us to do a lot of different experimentation within open source design, uh, digital fabrication, um, etc. Then the newest member to the office is Tech Studio. So we work a lot with different new technologies, if you will. So AR, VR, mixed reality, haptics, etc. And it was really the idea of making a lab where you can just come in, grab you know whatever tools you need, and then start uh, going crazy or just you know try it out, uh, if you will. All these pictures that I just showed you are fairly new. They are maybe eight months old or something like this. And that's because we really don't believe in us being set up to last, but to evolve. So pictures a year ago, or one and a half year ago from Space 10 looks completely different than what they do today. And it has nothing to do with us only thinking we should make a nice uh, redesign of the office <laughs> uh, every year or so on, but really to have that as part of the mentality to say, how can we constantly progress? How can we constantly check in and say, are we actually there? If yes, how can we move forward? Or, you know, are we not there? How can we then uh, get there? And, um, and the old um, Ingvar, uh, the founder of IKEA, actually had a quote. The most dangerous poison is the feeling of achievement. And the antidote is to every evening uh, think what can be done better tomorrow. I think, of course, like you should not live your entire life <laughs> according to this quote. But at least, you know, it's a good thing to have at the back of your, of your mind. The way we work at Space 10 is that we have kind of three pillars that we have built everything uh, around. And since we are a research and design lab, the first pillar is... is research and that's really about asking the questions being very very broad and explore and analyze and identify you know and really just like be open-minded in that sense asking all the questions and then move into design where we then try to ideate validate and hopefully also pilot some of these solutions that we come up with you know asking the questions and then finding the answers and then you can say it's all kind of wrapped in what we call space 10 culture and that's where we um, build community one thing that i showed you that we open up the doors for everyone to, to, to kind of come in and take part if they will, but also about sharing everything that we do. We have our uh, journal where we sh show all the research we do. We very openly communicate about everything we do, and that's really uh, the kind of the core of, of uh, Space 10 uh, culture. We have a saying at Space 10 that is, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, meaning that we always strive to surround ourselves with people that are smarter than us. So we have the Space 10 core team. As I mentioned, we are 30 people fairly small. We have a residency program where we can invite talent from all over the world in to work on a given project uh, for a fixed period of time. External collaborators, any given day we can be 150, 200 people working on Space 10 projects and that we can do without having to kind of manage all the things that follows with that many people. There are you know, tons of definitions of what uh, innovation is. The way we have then chosen uh, to see it and the approach that we have uh, chosen to take is to look at innovation way more as a platform or uh, an interface between IKEA, which is a huge company, and then global research and design uh, network. This year, we were awarded one of the world's most innovative companies by Fast Company. Of course, I show this slide because I'm extremely proud that we, <laughs> that we, that we actually managed to, to get awarded that, but also because I think this really shows that seeing innovation as a platform or an interface might actually be the right way to do it. So not saying, you know, 
being the experts, having all the knowledge internally, but way more saying the more we open up, the more we invite in, you know, the more likely we are to actually create a bigger impact. Um, and I want to start with, uh, with culture. So I think besides just building community and, and sharing everything we do, we also really use culture as kind of a, a tool, if you will, for us to get inspired and to, and to really get going. So the overall goal here is to uh, build and facilitate a global research and design uh, community. And we do that, of course, because we believe that when we bring them in, we can actually accelerate our mission way more. We have done that through many, many different activities um, we host a lot of uh, talks and events at our space in Copenhagen. We exhibit our projects, we exhibit other people's projects. Uh, from time to time we rent other locations to do bigger events. This was an audiovisual uh, performance by Liam Young. If you don't know Liam Young, I would encourage you to check him out. I think he's really, really cool. We do a lot of hackathons and workshops. We did not only one, but two festivals once. And then we're also very aware of the fact that we cannot change everything just from the, from the Copenhagen uh, location. So we have popped up in New York. This was uh, three years ago where we had a week-long program looking into the future of food. We have been uh, in London doing a pop-up during London Design Week where we looked into exploring spaces of tomorrow. We have been in Shanghai looking into the future of mobility and autonomous vehicles. So really kind of getting as much out there as possible. Two weeks ago, we opened up our second kind of office in, in Delhi, in India, that we will run over the next uh, six months as kind of like a learning outpost and really like being present where the many people um, um, are. And then all these events and all this um, communication that we do and all the feedback that we receive, that really informs uh, a lot of the things that we do uh, within uh, research. Societal, uh, uh, environmental and technical shifts that we believe it's likely to change uh, and shape uh, the future to come. There's like kind of like two approaches to the, to the research that we do. So one being uh, playful, the other one being insightful. When it comes to the playful part, we really believe in engaging through design. We really believe in the power of play, that we can actually reach um, many more people by, by wrapping everything up in a way that it's more engaging. And then of course also insightful for the people who want to deep dive a little more uh, into the topics as well as uh, functioning as um, bone on the meat in our in our research projects. Um, I would like to show you three different projects that we have done within research. The first one is called uh, Spaces on Wheels. This was really, you know, a heavily playful uh, research uh, project. And it was really to look into how we could create a more fulfilling everyday life if we don't need cars, but we have autonomous vehicles. And this was, of course, not a project that we wanted to put out there to say, like, this is what we're going to build in, you know, two years, five years, ten years. 15 years, but way more about kind of shifting the discussion from one thing to, uh, to another. And the whole thing started out with us Googling the future of the car. I mean, I don't know, I'm a huge car nerd myself. I really love cars, and I, as much as I would love to try the Audi uh, one up there, you know, with the, that looks something from Star Wars that can fly, I'm not really sure that I, that I think this is the future I want to move, uh, move into. I mean, there's so many things with this picture, right? I mean, first, kind of the design, so masculine, so cold, uh, but also kind of, hmm, if it's an autonomous vehicle, why do we have to build it as a car? Why do we need a steering wheel? Uh, so that we can sit, not like super comfortable, but a little bit awkward, <laughs> <laughs> and read a book. So that was really kind of the starting point, and we wanted to do something that was, you know, completely different from that, but still tackling this highly relevant topic, and it will be, you know, something that will happen, it will affect our lives. So we teamed up with a Berlin-based uh, trend studio called Phone Studio. And what we came up with was seven different visualizations of how the future of autonomous vehicles could be if we looked at them as um, spaces rather than uh, vehicles. And, and or not vehicles, but cars. So the first one is a cafe on wheels. We made a farm on wheels uh, where we really envisioned that we could, by the help of auto uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, bring locally produced uh, food closer to uh, to the consumer and also really thinking how could this accelerate accelerate smaller businesses if that was like an infrastructure that was in place where you could just put on the groceries and have them delivered back to you you know we are commuting like crazy uh, we spend so much time going from A to B what if there was actually an office on wheels where we were able to get some of the work done uh, maybe we could even have uh, shorter work hours because we had uh, more time to do it and be a little bit more efficient hotel on wheels so now this morning I flew into Berlin, it only took an hour, but I, I mean, if I had the opportunity to take a seven hour ride in a hotel on wheels, maybe I would actually uh, prefer that. 
doing a project like this, making the renderings, putting it out there, hopefully starting a discussion, uh, getting a lot of feedback, etc. That's 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 great. But we really want to engage more people in the in the actual work. We made an app that used the uh, AR technology, which which is now available in most newer phones. So now at the end of this video, it was the rendering of the car of the vehicles uh, coming, and but actually you can download it and using AR Kit, then you will actually see the you know whatever space you you order coming uh, down uh, the road. So so something completely different. Um, the grow room. It was a project we did at an architecture competition in Copenhagen back in 2016. We thought, okay, um, what could be interesting to look at here at an architecture competition? It's a huge issue that we are producing food so far away from consumption. We also know that it's quite tricky to um, to only rely on urban gardens on top of a roof or an empty plot to be the place where you can actually do it. Of course, uh, vertical farming could be one answer to how we could go about it. But we wanted to say, can we actually then combine architecture with food producing? It's food producing architecture. And that became this, this growing sphere. Um, it also sparked quite some interest and a lot of people started reaching out and asking whether or not they could exhibit it at their festival, at you know their office, at the, the community space, etc. And that's of course extremely flattering, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense if sustainability is in our DNA to then start shipping large structures all around the world. So what we did was we went back to the drawing board and looked at whether or not we were able to empower people to build it themselves. And the way we came up with, with, uh, with that was that we made an open source version. So it's a little bit of a smaller version of it. It's only made of one material. In our case, it was plywood, but it can be any sheet material. You need two rubber hammers and two people, and then you're actually able to build your own grow room. The first week after launching this project, it was downloaded more than 30,000 times. So every single week, there's a new grow room being built. People send us uh, pictures. And what is really the beauty about this project, I think at least, is as soon as you open source it, you go away from a one size fits all, and then you move towards a one starting point <laughs> fits all. Last research project I want to share is called Solarville. At the moment on the planet, there is almost a billion people who have little or no access to electricity. For the most part, they live in rural areas where it is either extremely expensive or near impossible to actually connect them to the current uh, grid we have today. And we also know that solar energy is, and, and solar panels is one of the fastest growing sources of new energy. It's simply no other clean energy that is remotely close to the development that uh, solar is. And if you have solar panels that are functioning well and you have a plentiful resource, at some point you would also be able to produce way more energy than you need. You know, as soon as you do that, as soon as you have that, you all of a sudden could become maker and trader of power as well as just a passive consumer. And then also in recent years, we've heard so much buzz about blockchain technology. First, you know, with all the crypto enthusiasts who, who all thought they would become the next billionaires. But really now we see, you know, the financial world has really, you know, taken on this, this uh, technology. And, and I think, you know, now we see it, you know, pop up everywhere. So shipping companies use it to trace their cargoes. You see uh, Whole Foods and Target in the States are using it to uh, trace their food supply, etc., etc. So we thought, okay, let's combine all these things and make Solarville. Um, so Solarville is a 1 to 50 scale model of a little miniature village. It's running on solar panels and using blockchain, which enables people to trade energy uh, automatically with each other whenever you have uh, excess energy or you need more energy. And this quote really outlines you know, the project for us. So when you buy energy from the community, the money goes back into the community. So here it's really about not saying how can we empower one household to, you know, be solar powered or uh, store the energy, but looking at how can a whole community benefit from a solution like this. So we also thought when we have to do a project like this, it doesn't make sense to make a model village from a very specific local uh, context. So we teamed up with two architects, uh, Sachs Nordevit, and asked them if they could look at making a more global uh, and inclusive design language for this project. So what they did was they researched different city grids all over the world and looked for two things, similarities and differences. At the end, they overlaid all the city grids 
and then traced kind of like the universal city grid, if you will. You have the archetype of a house, the yellow one, and then looked for um, what are the cultural marks that you can find in different parts of the world that really underlines this is a house from uh, China, this is a house from India, this is a house from uh, Kenya. Um, and then again overlaid it all and made it into this uh, model. It looks like a kid's toy or something you can play with, but that's the whole idea that hopefully by making something a little bit more global, a little bit more universal, we are maybe able to engage way more people in the project and have them want to come and play with it. So as I said, it's a working prototype. There is 30 houses. Half of them run on solar panels. Half of them have no solar panels. There is an LED indicator in front of every single house, and that indicates whether or not the, the house is selling energy back to the grid or whether or not it's buying energy from the grid. So it's really intuitive in that sense where you would be able to see, ah, okay, this house is you know, producing way more or this house is really consuming um, a lot. Under each house is an odroid based computer that works as two things, a smart meter and the computer that runs the blockchain. So what we did was we made a platform that show you the timestamp and the house ID and then the blockchain hash and then how much that house has either sold back to the grid or bought from the grid in this moment that we kind of measure it. The beauty about this is that we can also localize it. So right now it's the model is uh, is uh, exhibited in, in India. So we can say, okay, what is the average consumption per year in India? And then kind of tweak that into the model so we actually have a realistic picture of how this would look in an Indian context. Thinking a little bit more about it, this would en also enable us to start simulating how much a uh, you know, potential uh, community could either over a year or a month produce of excess energy that they could sell or uh, that they would need to, to produce. And as I said, you know, it's really about having everyone at every age being able to interact with the project and having it as fun as, as it is for a kid, as it is for a, as, as a grown-up. When we launched this project, I uh, also launched a report on kind of the current state of uh, solar energy for really to have people, you know, being able to also deep dive into it if, you know, either it, they want to from the get-go or the project sparks imagination and, and interest and really want to know more about um, the current uh, field. And it is very much like Mike Tyson puts it, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And that I think is very, very true. Um, and as I also mentioned before, by any means we do not want to be a secret lab. I think there are plenty, plenty, plenty of secret innovation labs out there that work on the you know, plans in a little vacuum. It, I imagine always that it's in a basement um, and nothing comes out of it uh, until maybe like three or five years later, and then they share their idea with the world and then you know, maybe it's too late. Maybe they had, you know, it is changing. The world is changing and it is going very, very fast. So like you really need to, to be at the forefront. You really need to get those inputs on whether or not you're on the right track because you simply, um, yeah. Last part is of course um, uh, the design process. So that's like, we have the community, we have the, the culture, we have the research, we have shared it with the world and that is all the things that feeds then our design uh, process. In design, we're really looking at designing inclusive, circular, and digitally enabled solutions for both people and planet. W you know, we've heard so much about human-centered design, and like, I'm not gonna say a bad word about it, but I think it's also about time that we start looking a little bit more holistic on it and say, how can we design solutions that are both for people, human-centered, and planet-centered as one uh, uh, thing. One project that we did, it's called uh, Local, and the project I showed you earlier with the, the Grow Room was kind of really the inspiration and the starting point for, for this project. By looking at how we can grow vertically, led us into um, building our own hydroponic farm in our basement, where we grew microgreens, which is super food because it's super nutritional, but you don't spend a lot of time, water, and energy on growing them, um, and then had our chef and food designer test out a lot of different things with it. And that we did also in London where we built up what we call local, and you can call it like the future salad bar, where we invited people in to test and try out some of these uh, recipes and these microgreens uh, and kind of the result of everything that we had tried to do um, and ask what they thought about it. And also more importantly, we invited kids in to kind of take part in it and understand and see what is hydroponic farming because there is a huge kind of disconnection between kids especially and the food that they, they consume. I read um, an, an, a research project from the UK that stated that 21% of the kids in the UK thought the milk came from, a, from the box in the fridge. Um, 
And I mean, I also laugh, but, uh, and it's, but it's also super tragic, but it's also, I mean, how can they not think? We are so disconnected to our food system today um, that we need to start letting people know um, where these things come from and let people know that we need to uh, consume closer to or produce closer to consumption. This is called Aero Farms. It's the largest indoor hydroponic farm in the world. It's in the US, in uh, New York. Two years ago, IKEA invested uh, a lot of money into this uh, company. I'm not saying that it was purely kind of our uh, projects that led to it, but uh, at least we also helped inspire and, and show the way. Another thing that also happened is that IKEA then recently committed to growing hydroponically in their stores by 2020. And IKEA sells a lot of meatballs every single year. That's no secret. But it would be fantastic to also see if they could do a lot of something else that doesn't have the same impact as the meatball, uh, for instance, has. I just want to end on a, on a beautiful quote by Ed Camus, which is uh, one of the founders of Pixar. The future is not a destination, it's a direction. And I think this is kind of wrapping up very, very well kind of how we want to see everything we do by never saying like, okay, if we just reach this goal, then it's good. Um, and I think if, we, if, like, if everybody thought like this, I think we would have a pretty good chance of actually also changing <laughs> some of these patterns that we see today, which is maybe not um, completely the right way uh, to go. So how can we always kind of progress and how can we progress together? That was all. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh, it was really nice. And my question is, uh, regarding to the job, um, what kind of employee you are looking for? <laughs> uh, which type of skill set do you want your next employees to have? I think what, what is pretty common for most of us that works in Space 10 is that we have somewhat of an entrepreneurial background. We have, you know, this mindset of, of like setting something up and like chasing it and doing it and running fast and now we are 30 people so of course we need, you know, internal processes and structures and all these things that we need and that you need when you grow. But still having that kind of mentality and mindset also makes us, you know, want to really, you know, kick off an, a project and just run with it and just go. So even though it is a super vague answer, um, that is probably what I think could be like the common thread. We never strive to be the experts. We have an architect and we have a fabrication specialist uh, working with us. It's way more to look for kind of the one that can facilitate all the different processes and bring in all the different people and then, you know, together go and, and do. But one thing, actually, a little commercial, we have a residency program and every fourth month we open up for everyone to apply. You have to answer a brief, but that's at least one way of uh, coming in and doing a project with us. I would be interested in what kind of research methods do you, do you apply to your projects? to gather information, to gather insights? I think it can vary um, a lot and I think it also comes from the nature that we are again such a small team so we often work with an external studio or uh, entity to, to do some of the research for us. Um, so th I think that can, that can vary quite a bit. Small question first, uh, why Copenhagen? And then how can we imagine uh, collaboration between you and uh, IKEA itself really looks like. Okay, um, long story short, there was a company uh, before called Art Rebels, um, which was like a creative community bridging uh, creatives with, with, uh, with industry. And it was through that uh, company that we got the chance to, uh, to, to work with IKEA, uh, essentially. And then your next question was how the collaboration with IKEA is. As, um, we know, as we know, innovation labs and how that is often perceived in a different way from the mother corporation. How are you able to kind of, um, you know, blur the lines between M IKEA employees and Space 10 employees? That's a good question. But I think, you know, the fact is that we do something which can seem so different from what IKEA does today, which also, of course, requires different skill sets, um, different uh, team size, different company size, all these things. So I think in that kind of nature, I think we are so far, uh, you know, apart in terms of that sense. But of course, you know, working with IKEA also requires that we are interfacing with them quite a lot and we, we love to do that. I mean, I'm not saying that we are either getting more embedded or moving more away, but it's, um, I mean, IKEA is, I, I, I mean, a couple of hundred thousand employees uh, worldwide. So 
I mean, just management level of, of something like that is completely different than, than what we are facing, um, which of course makes it easier for, for us to be more connected on an everyday basis on the, uh, in the office, which I think you also creates a difference. The question is like, you have uh, four or five different projects, completely different like sectors, different sort of purposes. And I was wondering how you actually, your, your, your colleagues work is that a competition? It's like every week you have some sort of I don't, presentation, pitch kind of session, and then some bosses would decide, oh, this guy, is, this, this project cool, we fund you. Or, or how, how does it work? Is it more like a collaborative way or like a more competitive way? Yeah, um, so I think in many ways we are very, very um, not competitive internally in that sense. Um, but what I didn't show you because, you know, maybe I should, but what I didn't show you is that we have four main areas that we look into. Uh, so one being solar energy, one being shared living, one being open fabrication, and one being natural interfaces and AI. Um, so naturally already there, you know, we kind of divide things into certain things. And then of course, depending on the maturity in that, you know, design case that we are working with, you know, is there a need for making a very playful, uh, engaging project in that sense? Uh, then, you know, that would probably be some people doing that. Um, but uh, since we are only 30 people, it's, you know, a lot of the people will at some point interface with the project. So it really feels like we are all together on it, even though we have, uh, have a, you know, um, a lot of different projects running at the same time.